Hello. Hello. Welcome to Are You Karate Kidding Me? Your source for Cobra Kai recaps, analysis, and so much more. Well, Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid and movies. Everything Miyagi-verse. Yes, everything relating to the Miyagi-verse. Which That's is right. our word for anything that has Mr. Miyagi's influence on it. My name is Colin Canaday. I'm Jenny Carlson. And we are two adamant Karate Kid fans with uh, a lot of insight and... Obsession. Obsession. Let's just call it obsession. I'm, I'm proud of that. Like, I don't mind admitting that I watch a few scenes of, you know, the Miyagi-verse at least once a day. Mm-hmm. The countdown to season two of Cobra Kai is on, and we are here recapping every single episode. By the time we're done, we will have season two at our doorstep ready to go. Yeah, we better. And we'll also throw in a few bonus episodes to keep from going crazy while we wait. Um, But in the meantime, let's get on to episode two, Strike First. Mm -hmm. And now this picks up pretty much where that left off. So episode two, Strike First. Got some beautiful establishing shots uh, of the San Fernando Valley with Dean Martin's Ain't That a Kick in the Head playing Mm -hmm. as Daniel LaRusso wakes up in a beautiful upholstered bed next to a beautiful sleeping woman. Daniel's morning routine is almost the polar opposite of Johnny's. It's really contrasting. We're not going to see an exact one for one what Daniel's day was like during the same time period as we Johnny's can just day. But, tell that he's having a great life. But we can assume. Everyone um, gets along and loves each other. He's the king in his kingdom, basically. How great is Amanda LaRusso? That's Amanda LaRusso, played by Courtney Hengler. She's awesome, but she's one of my favorite characters. She won't have speaking lines till later, but we get our first glimpses of her in this uh, montage. She and Daniel work together, it seems, in the montage, and then he gets in the car and heads home, I guess, from work, and that's where he has his actual kick in the head. That's right. Which is the sighting of the Cobra Kai dojo that Johnny has just put in the mini mall. Yeah, when he sees the dojo, he has flashbacks to all the horrible things he saw when Kreese was sensei at Cobra, of Cobra Kai. Yes. Cobra Kai is back in a big way. But then we immediately cut to Miguel and Johnny. It's day one in Cobra Kai dojo. <laughs> day one, lesson one. Yeah, strike first is the lesson That's right. for today. It is obvious that, oh yeah, this is where we learned that it's a gi, right? Yeah. Miguel's like, am I going to get the karate pajamas? He's like, this, these are not pajamas, this is a gi. Mm-hmm. And you're going to always refer to me as sensei. This is where the the comedy writing background of the showrunners becomes really apparent. Yeah. And it's really great. Like, the show creeps up on you with its drama, and but the, and the comedy's never heavy-handed. It's always used in such a way to pull you in and endear the characters to you. Mm-hmm. But they sell it so hard here that even when Miguel, played by Joel Mardonia, even when he pulls out his inhaler, yeah. you know, and he's like, No problem, Sensei. You, you punch me. I have asthma, so. And Johnny's like, Not anymore. We do not allow weakness in this dojo. It's funny rather than offensive, which is amazing. He's doing the real drill sergeant routine, just like Kreese did to him. Johnny is paying it forward. So you can leave your asthma and your peanut allergies outside. Is that understood? At Johnny's insistence, Miguel's asthma is purely imaginary, and Johnny dismisses it. Much to Johnny's credit, this is the last we hear of Miguel's asthma as well for the rest of the season one. Unless Miguel's asthma is a Chekhov's gun for the whole show. Ooh. Yeah. You know, Johnny's telling him, you know, you don't want to be a pussy, you want to have balls. Mm-hmm. If I didn't know that Billy Zabka was a really nice person in real life, that this guy is terrible. Johnny also really likes to tell Miguel to shut up. He basically just uses quiet whenever he wants to dominate the conversation. Quiet! Yeah, so, I mean, that's an interesting point. Like, Johnny is trying to do what Kreese did for him, but Johnny is clearly not the same person. He's kind of out of his depth this is the first time he's ever been in a true mentoring situation yeah i mean i think the other thing about johnny is because there's only one student like he can't he has to have a relationship with miguel he has to like actually engage because miguel is all he's got so he's made miguel get on the floor and give him like push-ups on his knuckles such as he can and and sit-ups and at that moment the health is this the health department inspector coming by that's right we learned that johnny's got to do all this stuff to get it ready for prime time. 
Oh, also in the scene with Miguel, before the health department inspector guy arrives, Yeah, Miguel's like, so I see you're a karate champion, Sensei. Johnny's like, yeah, I didn't lose a senior point my, my junior year. And, and Miguel's like, what happened to your senior year? And Johnny's yeah. just like, you know, get back to training. Yeah, we don't talk about that. So the health inspector's like, is this guy already a student? And Johnny's like, no, 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 this is just an illegal that I brought in. Johnny displaying a alarming amount of casual racism <laughs> indeed yeah but it's almost it's just it's just like breathing for him it's like an involuntary muscle johnny can't quite get taken seriously by the health department guy like he's like what's this snake it's a, and johnny's like it's a cobra and he's like oh yeah. yeah cobra k so obviously no one knows what cobra kai really is yet we'll catch back up with cobra kai in a minute but first we got to get back over to the encino hills country club the uh, self-same country club where um ali and her parents were members yeah where daniel had spaghetti dumped all over him when he was spying on ali and johnny saw him and hurt his feelings but now daniel's a member how, he's the how, big how, dog how does that figure i don't know i mean like i just can't i still can't get over it and and he and his Gorgeous witty wife are there with their younger kid, Anthony, who does not care about anything. He's played by Griffin Santa Pietro. And he just wants to play his Yeah, he wants to play his video game. Daniel desperately wants to engage with his children. I mean, it's an interesting situation, right? Because Daniel thinks he's gotten everything that he's wanted out of life, and in some ways he has, but there's still going to be these things that elude him, like a solid parent-child relationship, apparently. Exactly. Uh, Both his children are becoming increasingly distant. Uh, Well, they're privileged. Anthony starts out pretty distant. Sam comes and goes. She's going to start to grow outside of his influence. The seeds of that are already being planted. Uh, We also get to meet Aisha for the first time. Yeah, Aisha is Daniel and and Amanda's daughter, Sam. That's her friend. She's played by Nicole Brown. And Aisha comes up with her dad, who appears to also be a former athlete. We'll learn that. I mean, they're family friends at this point. And and Aisha's like, where's Sam? And, And it's obvious that, like... Amanda, Daniel's wife, is lying. She's covering for her. Then they cut back to Cobra Kai, and... Johnny is making Miguel do all the grunt work, essentially doing the work of improving the dojo, much as Daniel worked on Mr. Miyagi's dojo, except not nearly as focused or as purposeful. No, Johnny's Uh, just exploiting Miguel's labor. Johnny's motivations are a little more transparent. We learn that Miguel also has an absentee father. Uh, yeah, Miguel, Miguel Miguel gets a call from his mom, and Johnny's like, what is your mom? You know, Miguel's like, I can't tell my mom about this because she doesn't like violence. And mm-hmm. what about your dad? What does your dad think? And, and Miguel's like, I never uh, really knew my dad, so. And you can tell that Johnny's like, oh, man. I also like to point out at this point, in a way, I think one of the big themes is you know, millennials teaching the older generation just as much as it is about the older generation mentoring millennials. Yeah. Because, you know, for all the toughness that Johnny is teaching these kids, the kids are also teaching him to be sensitive and be accepting and be, you know, more earnest. The thing about Johnny, he's vulnerable. He can't help it. Like, he, he, he attaches. Now that we've seen that Johnny has a vulnerability to Miguel's need for a dad... Yeah, let's check in on some other millennials over at the LaRusso family swimming pool. Yeah, at the LaRusso Mance in Encino Hills, Daniel, Amanda, and Anthony come home to find their driveway full of cars, a pool party in full swing. Sam Mm -hmm. is there with the two girls that she was in the car with that hit Johnny Lawrence in the last episode. That's uh, Moon, played by Hannah Keppel, Mm -hmm. and Yasmin, played by Annalisa Cochran. And they're sitting there hanging out. Yasmin is like, isn't this great? Like, it's clear that they've kind of put Sam up to hosting this party. Yes. You know, these are the people that she's chosen to hang out with rather than nice, brainy Aisha from the country club. She's fallen in with a bad crowd. Yeah, and in that crowd also are the bullies who beat up Miguel. Yeah, one of them is uh, played by Josio. His name is Kyler. According to, I think, Yasmin is like... And Kyler's been eye-banging you all day. Yeah, gross. So gross. Like, gross. Not only is he in the picture, but he's also the one who Sam is connecting with. Or thinks she wants to connect with. And Daniel's like, get out of the pool. Like, yeah. it's time to go. Yeah, Daniel plays tough cop dad and busts up the pool party uh, like an Elliot Ness of Encino Hills. That's when Amanda pulls him aside to go back to the kitchen to play good cop a little bit. It sets up that Courtney Hengler is always the one with the reality check. When Daniel gets hot-headed, she's like, what are you doing? Yes. This is ridiculous. Which will come in handy as our world becomes increasingly karate-focused, yeah. kind of like karate opera. Yeah. 
So, and, and there's a, a comic relief moment that everyone talks about because the second in command bully comes out of the bathroom. His name is Brooks and he's played by Bo Mitchell. And he's like, skin dips and bong rips. And you can tell that this is like the high level of discourse yes. that Sam's preppy friends are bringing to the table. They're real scumbags. Yeah, um, they are. It's on Daniel to clean up the pool area after he kicks everybody out. Yes, and he retreats to the serenity of his dojo slash pool house slash storage room. His erstwhile dojo that's now full of, like, kids' toys and stuff, but he's still got a shelf with pictures of him and Mr. Miyagi at the tournament. Some very lovely Newspaper clippings. Right next to all the pool noodles. Exactly. And so you and he's, like, flashing back to when, you know, obviously Sam was little and she had her own little kid gi and he mm-hmm. was teaching her how to do everything and... It's obvious that they were like total besties yes. before she became a teenager and inscrutable to him. It's got a nice little soft focus. I mean, it's cheesy, but we'll give it to them. If you want to do a regular segment called Easter Egg Hunt, those news articles from the storage area are exact mock-ups of some of the same news clips from like Karate Kids 2 and 3. I'm pretty sure that the art on the wall is a, is a Miyagi family photo, I think, from Karate Kid Part 2. So anyway, we see that Daniel's reflecting about his relationship with Sam and he wants to apologize for maybe overreacting. Meanwhile, she's on a group video chat with Yasmin and Moon. And you can tell from the dynamic that Moon is sort of a space cadet with a heart and Yasmin is cold-blooded and and used the, the totaling of Johnny's car. Yeah, Yasmin's cold as ice. As an excuse to get her dad to buy her a new car. Yeah. She needs a ride from Sam. And so anyway, but Daniel comes in and Sam closes the computer and... And uh, Daniel apologizes, and Sam is like, you know, Dad, I'm sorry. It's my fault, too. Like, Daniel's trying to play nice about this, and he's like, you know, so are there any guys out there I need to be worried about? And Mm -hmm. Sam's like, well, there's this one guy, Kyler, which is the ultimate jerk bully boyfriend name. I mean, I I thought that Johnny Lawrence was the best bully name because it's got such such perfect symmetry, but no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Kyler is truly... Well, I mean, yeah, if you want to go millennial bully names, that's pretty good. Is that a, is that a name that kids have? I it's, apologize to any Kylers. It's a what? it's a portmanteau of names that kids have, wow. which is worse in in a lot of ways. These these, um, these writers are scary good. Yeah, but uh Daniel uh boy, it's 30 years is a long time and Daniel gets to have a father-daughter talk with Sam and there is no universe where that's not awkward. No, super awkward, super awkward. But he's like, we can have Kyler over for dinner. And, you know, after establishing that even though they've been texting, there are no images, just words. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Things are looking better with Daniel and Sam. And now we are here in the what looks like first week or so of high school. Yes. So we're back. We're now over at West Valley High with our new friends, Eli and Dimitri. This is their first appearance. Yeah. Miguel walks up to them Uh huh. and uh, is looking for a table. It's obviously like the first week of school. And remember, Miguel moved here from, what, Riverside or something? That's right. So he doesn't know anybody. And, and he sits He's at the table. He's a new kid. So. Yeah. There's only one table that has like extra seats. These kids are very awkward. Yeah. <laughs> To say the least, Eli, played by Jacob Bertrand, and Dimitri, played by Gianni DiCenzo, they are awkward AF. Miguel is looking around, and he sees the cute girls in a moment, just like, speaking of an Easter egg hunt, just like in The Karate Kid when Daniel's looking over, and he's like, who are they? And, and Freddie Fernandez is like, they're rich kids from the hills. Yeah. yeah. It's the same deal. Those are the rich kids. Yeah, it is the same deal. I mean, it's not quite the same unstructured playtime that, that was right in the middle of the Bananarama sequence. No, but they're, they're not roasting he, sausages and yeah. playing sand soccer. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eli is pretty quiet at this point still. Um, Dimitri is just, God, he is obnoxious. He is he is the kid who thinks he has all the lines. I'm so the Dimitri, though. Like, at least I used to be. I like to believe that I've moved my way over towards a more, like, self-assured, less mm-hmm. smart-ass character. But, oh, it should also be noted that at this moment, now that Miguel has pointed out um, the, the cute girls... Um, now they're talking about the girls and kind of looking at them and the girls are looking back at them and, and Miguel's like, they seem nice. And either Dimitri or Eli's like, yeah, they're, it's Eli. He's like, you know, cause he's got a, he's got a, I guess a, a cleft lip that's been, that's had surgery to get it fixed. And, mm-hmm. um, he's like, they're probably looking at my face and Miguel's like, no, they're not. And then of course the girls totally are because Yasmin is, you know, making fun of him quietly. And Sam is like trying to laugh along with Yasmin, but you can tell that she's bothered by it. Yeah. Oh my God, you guys. You see that guy over there who looks like he went down on a lawnmower? 
That is so wrong. So Miguel gets up to try to say hi to Sam, and she actually, like, acknowledges him. But then, boom, here come the bullies. What are you doing? Striking first. What's up, ladies? And they join Yasmin and Moon and Sam around the table. See you later, Rhea. Yeah. And and it's funny because, like, this is... Miguel has, like, three moments over the course of his growth as a karate as a karate kid like uh-huh. one of them is like Johnny teaches him the lesson is strike first and you know, he gets up to try to strike first and that fails now cut back immediately over to the Cobra Kai dojo where we are in the middle of punching practice uh, with a dummy uh, very similar to the dummies in Karate Kid Part 3 yes Johnny's doing the thing where he's showing you the perfect ways to injure people with punches which is something that you do at like you know a level ten self defense class, not level one karate class. Yeah, he's basically like, let's turn you into Darth Vader so you can crush their tracheas. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the heat flow through you. <laughs> you know, again, Shop Johnny, Johnny, style. not not the experienced mentor. He's jumping. From, he's going from one to sixty. Obviously, that's only for extreme situations. He is. Um, but Miguel, at this point, is just sort of like trying to figure out the dummy when Johnny gets a phone call. Yes. And the phone call is from Robbie's principal. Robbie is the... The kid from the refrigerator the in the last the, episode. The kid from the picture on the refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah. So the principal kindly informs Johnny that Robbie is dealing drugs, specifically Molly. That, Johnny thinks Molly's a girl at school. Right, yeah, there's a little bit of confusion. Johnny's still being stuck in the 80s, much like Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer. On SNL? Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm just a caveman. Your world frightens and confuses me. It does not go well for Johnny. No. Uh, he Robbie gets the phone, basically tells Johnny off. He's a loser. He doesn't care. Well, yeah, Robbie's played by... He doesn't want to go to school. Yeah, Robbie's played by Tanner Buchanan, and he has a very much like a... What is it? Sean Hunter vibe? Or like one of these sort of tough guy bully people from the... Yeah. From like 80s and 90s shows. I could see that. I could also see like a... Like an evil Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Yeah, well, I think that's mostly the hair. Yeah. I'm getting a little bit of Bender from Breakfast Club off of Robbie. I thought you were going to say Bender from Futurama, and I was like, we got to go to bed. That is not... Either way. Either way. Uh, no. No. Um, he's a real archetype. He's rebel without a cause. She hands the phone over to Tanner Buchanan as Robbie, and he's like... Don't try to play dad now. You're a pathetic loser. And you could tell that Johnny is just so beleaguered from the get-go. Yes. As soon as he knew anything that had to do with Robbie, he was like, ugh, this is going to be trouble. Mm -hmm. And then he looks like he's been punched in the gut. You know, the call goes nowhere, and the the principal says, I guess I'll have to call his mother after all, even though she's not answering. Yeah. So then Johnny gets off the phone, and this is something that is so great about the show. Like, this shitty thing happens to Johnny. And, right. and now, because he can't resolve it, he's like, are you going to take that? You got to, you got to, you know, man up basically and hit this dummy. Like you got him, yeah. Miguel. Johnny does a lot of projecting throughout the series. Yes, and he does. He use, and to his credit, he, he, it focuses him very well. Like yeah. once, once Johnny has some anger to, to jump off of, that's when things come together for Johnny and that's how he can make it all work. But the problem then is that he's egging Miguel on to act out the anger that he feels right so he's, Mig- you know, he's like there's got to be someone you want to punch basically and miguel's Mi- actuating his rage yeah and miguel's like obviously thinking of kyler yes um because kyler you know beat the crap out of him and then cut in on his connection with sam yeah and the cafeteria so we see before we cut to the next scene miguel wailing on that dummy yeah just like looking more evil than we can imagine that sweet kid looking yeah, fortunately, Kyler's not there. Kyler is across town at the LaRusso residence. With all the family sitting poolside mm-hmm. as Daniel makes him his famous LaRusso Ponzutoro. Ooh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Daniel uh, really <laughs> is getting pretentious at yeah. this point. No, no, in fairness, he picked up the, this knowledge during on his trips to Okinawa. Oh, no, it was all, look. Daniel earned every single thing that he's gotten out of life. Including the knife that he uses he, he, to cut the Ponzu Toro, he named, to cut the Toro. Exactly. He name drops Okinawa. Again, if you're on that Easter egg hunt, this is a nice uh, reference to Karate Kid 2. Now, that, but uh, that knife, I'm going to say it, that knife is the one that the villain uses to basically, spoiler alert, zip line in on a lantern string to try to beat the crap out of Daniel in Karate Kid Part 2. Behind you! Ah! 
Get back to our kid up. So then. I mean, it's a good story. Maybe Daniel should have led with that. Yeah, then the kid Maybe, would eat them fish. Yeah, that would that would really grab Kyler's attention. Yeah, and Kyler Kyler is like, I don't eat fish. Daniel's like pouring this 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 ponzu yeah. sauce over the cut of fish that he got at the market this morning. Yeah, way to tell us now, Kyler. Yeah, I mean, you'd think that it was because Kyler was like was like eco conscious because actually Toro is bluefin tuna, which is you know often unsustainable but no he just doesn't like fish and then sam's like no you like fish what about the fish sticks at school and kyler's like oh yeah fish sticks are dope you have fish sticks it's a, it's a total fail it's a total fail yeah once i mean once again daniel desperately trying to find someone anyone to mentor please yeah he's, uh, he's looking he doesn't know it but, but he's trying to yeah. connect He's trying to connect. Unfortunately, it just comes off as him mansplaining Japanese culture to Kyler. Well, and it's interesting to watch Daniel like go from being kind of appropriating Okinawan culture to demonstrating a legitimate engagement with it. Mm-hmm. Um, Sam and Amanda yeah. have gotten up to try to find Kyler food he's able to eat. Yeah, Daniel's alone with Kyler, trying to connect with him anyway. And you know, he's like, "I learned this from an old friend of mine." And he's like, "Where are your parents from?" And because Kyler's Asian looking, and yeah. so like he's like, that's all we know. And and you know, Kyler's answer is Irvine, I think. This is a situation where Daniel's reached a point in his life where he thinks he's <laughs> uh, I we have a, a screenshot up right now and Daniel's just looking at me. Um, <laughs> well no as if, as if as if to say what? What are you about to say? <laughs> in fairness, he's looking at Kyler like this yeah. guy is so underwhelming. Yeah. Because he's like, I thought this was gonna be so different. Yeah. I went to the Asian market, I like bought this bluefin tuna. Yeah. You know, I, I made this 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 ponzu sauce that is a you know delicacy. What the hell? Yeah. And this Asian kid can't even connect with me like he doesn't even know where his parents are from in that whole like you yeah. know in that in that casually ethnocentric humor right well the only point i was about to make was daniel's reached a point in his life where he th- he thinks he's done engaging with this culture and the, the secret is you're never done engaging in other cultures you always have something well, new actually, to learn i don't think daniel thinks he's done i think that daniel doesn't know that he's disconnected like he's well, that's what I'm saying. Like he thinks he's he's made his connection and that it will always be there. But it's like a connection is only something that you get by being constantly connected. Well, I mean, I disagree with that. But but like in the sense that like I think that Daniel has a connection, but he's looking in other people for his connection to Okinawa, and he hasn't yet figured out that he needs to get back to karate. Like Daniel's lonely. He's lonely for Mr. Miyagi, but Mr. Miyagi isn't just in, like, Japanese things or bonsai trees even, although they are awesome. Bonsai tree. Mr. Miyagi's in the practice of karate and finding your balance, right? Right. But so, you know, Daniel's just looking for those those fictive kinship ties mm-hmm. in all the wrong places. True. And he's trying to talk to Kyler and then actually has a Mr. Miyagi moment asking Kyler about stuff, and he's all like... Right. So tell me about that shiner you got there. A, almost a direct line from the Karate Kid when Mr. Miyagi's like, What happened to I? After the bullies have beaten up on Daniel. Oh, that's right. Daniel's yeah. Like, How'd you get that shiner? And, and Kyler tries to lie. And then Daniel's like, Daniel, desperate for that connection, it all but turns his chair backwards and says, Let's rap. <laughs> yeah. No, but like Daniel's trying to understand who this kid is. Like, is he a tough kid who's going to cause trouble for his daughter? Right. You know, Daniel's trying to be sympathetic. And then he finally pries the story out of Kyler, who lies, mm. that he was like getting some like energy bars or something at the, at right. the mini mall. And oh, yes. He tells the tale. Yeah, he tells the tale. He says, you know, Daniel's like, I know that kid's going to be tough. Assuming that Kyler's the bullied and not the bully. We got jumped out of nowhere by a karate master to which the bells go off in Daniel's head. And he's like, what strip mall? What mini mall was this? What mini mall? Karate, you say? Yeah. There's only one man I know in this town who does karate out of a strip mall. Exactly. There's only one man I know who would beat up on a nice kid like you, Kyler. There's only one man who would dare give me the raspberry lone star johnny lawrence well, johnny lawrence okay cut to the cobra kai dojo where johnny is finally finally filling out the application for i guess insurance for the dojo sure and he's still got miguel it's an inscrutable form he's still got miguel cleaning everything and miguel's wiping down some the some glass windows and miguel's like any way you want me to clean this and johnny's like no i don't give a shit no wax on wax off no, for miguel no no remember to breathe no yeah. nope just just clean the damn windows yep 
and then Johnny, you know, in total frat boy mode, like enjoying the thought of hazing Miguel, sends him into the bathroom to clean the toilet. As Johnny says, be sure to do it on your hands and knees while Miguel puts in the headphones. And may I just pause for a moment and say, yeah. how much of this show revolves around the use of headphones as a plot device, both in the Karate Kid, but also in Cobra Kai? Anyway. Fair. While Miguel can't hear and Johnny's in the back office, the front door opens and Daniel LaRusso, fresh from dinner with Kyler, having eaten all that fish himself, I presume, walks in and looks at the Cobra decal on the wall with the exact same expression that he had when he was a 16-year-old kid Mm. coming into Kreese's Cobra Kai Dojo. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Daniel says some things change. He heard that Johnny was beating up on some teenagers. Johnny, of course, insists that Daniel has it all wrong, that he doesn't know those kids or Sam as well as he thinks he knows, which is them's fighting words, really. Johnny's just like... What are you talking about? I didn't, you know, beat up on some innocent kids. I beat up on some assholes. Mm-hmm. And Daniel's like, just like, whatever. Just stay away from my daughter's friends. Mm-hmm. And Johnny's like, your daughter's friends? Yeah. Yeah. So Johnny has a sense of righteousness about this encounter now. Right. And he can't believe that Daniel is trying to intervene. Those people were picking on a kid half their size ironically johnny tells daniel to put his house in order which uh, (laughs) a strange insistence coming from johnny just as it looks like they're going to fight it's just a tease because miguel appears this is so great because you know like johnny's pissing daniel off and 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 it look and they're just beginning to walk towards each other to fight and and miguel runs in just like joan rivers in space balls what the hell is that noise that was my virgin alarm. In fact, this is, you know, the second Spaceballs reference we've made, this review. That's fine. Yeah, no, it's totally fine. He runs in like the virgin alarm. Mm. And so we don't get to see Johnny and Daniel get it on the mat. Well, I get to pull two Spaceballs clips today. You Boy, love your I love, clips, Aren't man. I lucky? I know. Um, so, yeah, Daniel insists that you and I, this, we aren't done. As enemies or friends or frenemies or whatever you want to call them, that wraps it up for episode two of Cobra Kai. You know, what's going on here with these characters? So Daniel's life is not perfect. We're led to believe it's going to be great. And then Mm -hmm. we see all these cracks in the facade. Right. And it's interesting because thus far, at least, the story doesn't seem to be um, making it about, you know, there's a bad person in Daniel's life or anything external. Mm -hmm. It's all internal to Daniel and internal to his world. Yeah. He needs to get right with himself somehow. Yeah. And Johnny is trying to be badass through Cobra Kai, but still has these lingering frustrations. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting dichotomy. Like, both of them are opposites. They're yin and yang. Both of them have good things about them, but neither of them have, like, the full picture, right? Yeah. So Johnny is very good at pulling himself up by his bootstraps and being self-actualized when he wants to be. You know, he can pull it together for brief periods to, you know, be an effective person. He's just been so beaten down by, kind of literally by his training and crease and his defeat that... He just can't seem to have it all together for very long. Whereas Daniel has done a very good job of building up things to a place where he wants them, or at least where he thinks he wants them. Well, I think he's got he's got things things in his life are in a good place, but the problem that Daniel has is that he doesn't know what he wants for himself. Mm-hmm. Like he's got a family, you know, he's providing for them and all that, but like he's not right with himself. You know, he's clearly yearning for something related to his past. Yeah. They're both after something from the past that they feel like they've lost. And by the end of episode two, we see that whereas in episode one, Johnny, for reasons that are both silly but make perfect sense, Johnny has decided that pissing Daniel off is going to make him happy. Daniel's like, it's my mission now to thwart this dojo Mm -hmm. one way or another. And it's not like mwahaha scheming. It's just more like, this is stupid and this fight isn't over yet. I I like the way that they argue because even though it's sort of an odd alternate universe in which karate really matters a whole lot, it's still a human place. 
Which is cool. Very much so. So, Jenny. Yes, Colin. Did you like this episode? I did like this episode. I like this episode. I mean, I'm going to like every episode. Yeah, but I'm just thinking like on a scale of Karate Kid 1 to Karate Kid 3, uh, this is still pretty high up there. All of these episodes for me are between Karate Kids 1 and 2, and that's like, that. it's not even a spectrum, it's like... Well, that's a good place it's to be. It's a singularity. Okay. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, the thing about this episode is that you can see it from Daniel's perspective. Mm-hmm. He's sympathetic and... At the same time, we can still have sympathy for Johnny. Like, this episode is the one that shows you that you can identify with both of them, and that's okay. Yeah. This is the one where you're like, oh, so I'm not going to just redeem Johnny now. Like, I'm going to see these two guys try to figure it out or not. I mean, I agree with that. I I don't know if I like it quite as much as the opening, because I'm trying to cast my mind back to when I was watching it for the first time. Episode one sets you up with the idea that you're going to be following Johnny the whole time. But episode two changes up things sharply where we realize that, no, we'll either be following Johnny and Daniel equally, or this is more of an ensemble show where we're mainly going to follow Johnny and Daniel. And then maybe, you know, Miguel and Sam and a few of the other kids to a lesser degree. But it's mostly not Johnny and Daniel's show. So these episodes one and two set up that dichotomy uh pretty clearly yeah we see that there it's an ensemble show that's organized around not just these two poles of these dojos but also you know johnny and daniel's personal journeys Mm -hmm. yeah but i don't know because part of the thing with cobra kai is that the episodes are so short you're always wanting the next episode they're not only pitched to be a binge worthy in terms of the way they build suspense but they're also just short So it's hard to have one that you're like, this is the perfect one. Although I do have a couple of perfect episodes that I will say this is the perfect episode. I had a feeling, and we'll get to those when we get to them. Yes. Um, Anyway. Next time we review Cobra Kai, it will be episode three, right? Yeah. So that about wraps it up for this one. When we come back next time, we will pick it up with Cobra Kai, episode three, Esqueleto. We will pick it up with Cobra Kai three, Esqueleto. That sounds good. So until that time... I've been Colin Kennedy. I remain Jenny Carlson. And we'll see you later. See you around the Miyagiverse. This podcast has been produced and hosted by Colin Kennedy and Jenny Carlson. Our music is by Chepo. You can find us online at areyoukaratekiddingme.com and wherever you download podcasts.